All right, greetings everyone. Uh, welcome back to the second part of the video for section 2.4, continuing on with our study of continuity. So before we dig into our new stuff, just wanna remind ourselves of what it means for a function to be continuous at a point. So remember we have these three criteria we have to check. If we're trying to uh, determine whether a function is continuous at a particular point A, where A is um, an input value. So the first one is that f of A is defined, so A would actually be in the domain of our function. Secondly, the limit as x approaches A of f of x exists, and so that assumes that the limit exists from both sides. And that third criteria there, that the limit as x approaches a of f of x actually is equal to uh, what we get when we input that value into the function. Um, so if any one of those criteria is violated, then we know that the function would be discontinuous at that particular point. All right, so let's look at an example uh, involving piecewise functions. So we're told that we have this function g of s, and we'll pay close attention here to the fact that s is our variable, our input variable there. So we have that g of s uh, is given by the function or the formula 6x minus three if s is less than or equal to six, and then negative 6x plus b if s is greater than six. And they tell us that f of x, sorry, that should not say f of s, x, that should say g of s. I'll talk to my PowerPoint guy about that one. Uh, it's a function which is continuous everywhere, then what value must we have for b? So our goal here is to figure out what is the value of b so that this function is continuous. Now, notice that b does not appear in the top part of the function here, the 6s minus 3 for values of s that are less than or equal to 6. So what I'm actually gonna do here is start by just graphing that. So if we think about it, the function 6s minus three, that's a linear function. And according to what we're given, we only use that for values of s, our input variable that are less than or equal to six. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm first gonna input six into that function. So if I do that, I'll have six times six minus three which give us 36 minus three, which is 33 is the output there. So I'm gonna mark on my um, graph over here. I'm going to, let's see if I can get this with the stylus. I'm going to count by fives here. So that'll be a five and then a 10, negatives of course, and negative 15 and negative 20 here, and then maybe I'll just skip some here. So this is 10, 20, and then 30 is here. Okay, and then along the horizontal axis, I'm gonna count by ones. So this will be one, two, three, four, five, and here's six. So we just saw that if we input six into our function there, we get an output of 33. So that'd be right about here somewhere. Okay. And then I'm also gonna input zero into that function. So if I do that of six times zero minus three, so it looks like I get an output of negative three. So I have a line here or a dot down here somewhere. And if we connect those two, Looks like that part of the graph is doing that. And then up there at six comma 33, we know we should have a closed dot, right? Because this is um, a less than or equal to sign here. Okay. So now, now that we have that, how do we determine what the value for B has to be, right? <sighs> So we're gonna use the fact that we're told that the function is continuous everywhere, right? And so what that means is that when we draw the second part of the function here, which I'm gonna outline in green, 
that there can't be any breaks in the graph, right? It can't start like here and go like this because then we have a function that is discontinuous. So it must meet um, the other piece of the graph right here at this point, 633, which tells us that if we look at the function negative 6s plus b, that if I input 6 for s, so if I do negative 6 times 6 plus b, the output there has to be 33, right? And so we can work that out. We'll have negative 36 plus b equals 33. If we add 36 to both sides, then we end up with 69, I think, would be the value for b there, OK? So this function will be continuous everywhere if um, that value there for b is 69 because it'll meet right here at this point here. And then the graph will do whatever it does from there. I think it does something like that. OK? Cool. All right. Um, let's talk about an application of continuity. And this is one of those misleading word uses of the word application. So I'm going to say application, but it's not going to be to a real world thing. It's going to be to another um, area of math. So let's say we have a function here um, that is f of x equals x squared plus 5x minus 1. And it's we're looking at it over the interval 0 to 2. And so those represent input values there. Uh, so the first thing we're asked to do is find f of 0. So we can just input 0 into the function. So we'll do f of 0 equals 0 squared plus 5 times 0 minus 1 equals negative 1. We can also do f of 2. So we have 2 squared plus 5 times 2 minus 1. If we work that out, we'll have 4 plus 10, 14 minus 1, so 13. So we have the f of 0 is negative 1, and f of 2 is 13. And then the third part says, assuming that f of x is continuous at every point along that interval, so that would mean there are no breaks in the function, can we conclude, without looking at the graph, that there exists a number c in the interval, so meaning some number between 0 and 2, for which f of c equals 0, meaning if we input that value into the function, the output is 0. So are we guaranteed? there is some number between 0 and 2 such that if we put input it into the function f we're going to get 0 as an output and we're told that this function is continuous at every point on that interval so what do you guys think hmm well let's i know it says not to look at the graph but let's use a graph here somehow so we were told, or we saw that when we input zero into this function, we got an output of negative one. So that would be a point down here. And then when we input two, we had 13. And we're told that this function is continuous, which means that basically if we're gonna graph or draw the graph between those two points, there's gonna be no breaks in it. And you see what happens or why that tells us that there has to be some value between zero and two for which the output value is zero. Well, let's suppose not. Let's suppose that there was no such value. Well, notice that all output values of zero occur right here along the horizontal axis, right? So that would mean that if there was no value where the output was equal to zero, then the function is never going to cross the horizontal axis. However, is it possible if I start at this first point here to draw the graph somehow so that it's continuous, meaning it's somehow going to connect with this point up here without crossing that horizontal line? And the answer, my dear friends, is no, right? We have to cross that line if we're going to connect these two points without having a break. So to go from this one to this one, for example, 
notice that I have to cross the horizontal axis right there. So the fact that one of those was negative and one of those was positive and the function was continuous, meaning no breaks in it, guaranteed for us that somewhere along there, the output had to be zero. So does there exist such a number? The answer would be yes. Now, notice that we didn't actually find what that value is. And of course we could using some techniques we learned in pre-calc one, but that's not what we were worried about. We were just worried about proving that such a number existed, okay? And so what we just saw is an example of what's called the intermediate value theorem. So the intermediate value theorem tells us that if F is a continuous function on some interval, meaning that there's no breaks in the function along that interval, and n is some number between the output values for each of those endpoints, so between f of a and f of b. And we also have this added part that f of a cannot equal f of b. Okay, then there's some number c in the interval between a and b such that f of c equals n. And I like this visual here that shows why that is. So we see here's the value a, here's the value b, those are our two endpoints. Here's f of a and f of b, and then n is somewhere in the middle. And because the function is continuous, okay, when we trace along it, there has to be some out input value. In this case, they're calling it c, where if we input that value into the function, we get an output of n. And again, that's dependent on the fact that this function is continuous. All right, thank you guys for your attention.